Hello and welcome to My Security TV and our Tech and Sec Weekly. My name is Chris Cubbage. I'm the Executive Editor and Director with My Security Media. And today we're joined by Matthew Warren, Professor of Cybersecurity, College of Business and Law, and Director of the RMIT University Centre for Cybersecurity Research and Innovation. Uh, obviously, there at RMIT University in Melbourne. Matthew, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, a pleasure to be here. Great. Uh, now, this is your second appearance, so thank you so much uh, for coming back on. I think this was going back to October 2020, I, I looked at, so, so it's been a little while. Um, we're going to be looking at cyber war tactics, uh, something that your centre has been doing, and you've also just uh, signed an agreement with uh, Lithuanian University as well for a cybersecurity research uh, network. So that kind of the timing was quite unique uh, as well. Yeah. And I'm thinking we might start with the cybersecurity research network. Uh, yeah. And I've got it in front of me here is the Mycolis Remaris University uh, as well. So maybe the background to that. And then I think we can uh, sort of lead off yes. into Russia, Ukraine. Of course. So um, I, I spent um, a lot of time uh, in, in what I call frontline states, uh, the Baltic states, the Scandinavian states, uh, trying to understand uh, the cybersecurity threats that they face uh, in terms of traditional threats and, and hybrid threats, because it's something that Australia doesn't face the same magnitude or we face very different threats. So I've spent you know, a number of years, particularly in the Baltic, particularly in Lithuania, uh, developing relationships, uh, you know, having um, conversations with governments, university research institutes. And really, uh, I, I then became a, uh, a visiting professor at at uh, Mykonos Mimnos University as well. And it just seems sort of a natural progression uh, was to develop that relationship uh, to the next stage and uh, develop a research network uh, that uh, would allow us to explore the cybersecurity issues and challenges that face Australia and Lithuania. And uh, and it's strange w w w when when this was announced, I, I had a few people contact me and say, "Why Lithuania?" Well. And I thought the same thing. <laughs> uh, well, because Lithuania is, you know, a very advanced, uh, you know, country in terms of, uh, from a technology perspective, a, you know, cyber security, digital finance perspective. They're very much focusing on wanting to export digital exports in technology. Uh, but being what I call a frontline state, that, that they're facing an ongoing issue uh, against uh, in, uh, cyber influence from Russia uh, in terms of information war, information warfare campaigns, electoral interference. And uh, it's a situation that Australia hasn't faced to that same extent. And literally, you know, to, to, to be at briefings and they say, you know, Matt, you know, this is the cyber influence attack that's occurring today. Take me to the site, show me then the impact. You, you, you know, it's things that you're seeing really in, in real time yeah. uh, that, that we've simply not seen in in Australia. And and and. And the thing that got me was uh, talking to, uh, you know, a CEO of, of, of an organization, large Lithuanian organization. And, and I said, you know, what keeps you up at night, you know, concerned about cybersecurity? Uh, you know, if that was Australia, you know, CEOs or CISOs, you know, talk about ransomware attacks or, mm. you know, uh, massive outages. But what he he said was, I'm scared of the attacks on our democracy and uh, and how cyber is used as part of those attacks. And, and really, f for me, that that, that 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 was a moment that I suddenly realized, you know, these frontline states are dealing with a different situation that we're dealing here in uh, Australia. 
I suppose it's the, the the motivation of those attacks is different. Obviously, the risk we find in cyber is global because it's a global network. But then once you are subject to an advanced persistent threat that is targeting you, mm. uh, that's a different story. And I look back to our first interview, was the new normal in the info wars, Russia and Iran take on the US election. Mm. And that was the timing uh, mm. that we last spoke was in the lead up to the US election. And we have seen it over time. Um, the other one was the research network was launched by the Lithuanian Minister of Foreign Affairs in Australia. Was that a timing thing or he came over for this? Uh, so so he uh, he came over. Uh, he, he, he wanted, uh, he was coming over to Australia. So, uh, you know, uh, the uh, Lithuanians just uh, opened uh, a new um, embassy uh, in uh, Canberra. Yeah. So he was coming over for the launch of the embassy. So it made sort of perfect timing uh, for um, Gabrielis um, Landsberg uh, to open uh, open the forum, uh, which he did. And uh, and and it's you know one of the things I found in Lithuania is 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 speaking to their. Uh, politicians of, of of all their parties is the passion that they have about Lithuania, the passion that they have about their country and protecting their country. And and in it in something I, I haven't sort of seen in in Australia because Australia's not in that that position. Because if you think of, of Lithuania, you know, they have a, a physical border with Russia, uh with Kaliningrad, uh which was formerly East Prussia, but after Second World War became the Russian province of Kaliningrad. Uh, they uh, also have a long border with Belarus, and Belarus is now, you know, extremely strong ally of Russia. You know, taking now direct military action against the Ukrainians. So you have a small country with a population, you know, of less than three million, bordered uh, in bordered yeah. by the Russians and the Belarus uh, and that's physically that that's the physical threats as well as you know having to deal with the cyber threats having to deal with the information warfare uh, attacks the attacks upon their democratic processes as I said it's it, it's a situation unless you've sort of been there and you know spoken to the people and 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 really sort of understand the situation is that you you really understand you know what a challenge it is and also how how they have such a passion as we've seen with the ukraine it, yeah. a passion to deal with, with these issues and they're very upfront that that, that, that that they know uh what the issues are lithuania is in a slightly different situation in the fact that they're part of the European Union and more importantly part of NATO so if there is any physical... Well, it's going to be my question Matthew how much support would do they get in in a cyber context of at, at NATO uh, you know and and what's been your observations around NATO uh, as well? Well certainly um, if you go back to 2007 uh, that that was when the Russians launched their first cyber attack upon, upon a country and that was Estonia so what happened in Estonia was that the Estonians wanted to physically move a statue out of the centre of Taningrad, uh, and the statue uh, was uh, to celebrate the Soviet liberation of uh, of of Estonia, uh, and they wanted to move the Soviet era statues to a park just outside Tallinn. So they weren't wanted to destroy it; they were just wanted to put all the Soviet era statues in a memorial park, uh, and and that's what they did. Uh, the uh, Soviet uh, site that the Russian minority population uh, in Estonia were influenced by information. It, uh, from Russia and rioted, uh, the the country uh, experienced massive cyber attacks up to the lead uh, to, to, to the May Day holiday, which um, in Russia is is a celebration, uh, you know, around uh, the liberation of, of 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 Europe and the defeats of, of Nazism. So after uh, and that was a cyber attack upon a NATO country. 
And in 2007, NATO didn't know how to deal with a cyber attack. So what NATO did was develop a, you know, a cyber center of excellence, which is uh, based in Tallinn and Estonia. Uh, they now deal cyber as a direct threat. They increased their infrastructure, increased their capability. They also developed a law manual called the Tallinn Law Manual, which describes the legal framework in which a cyber warfare stroke information warfare campaign can be conducted. So, so, so since 2007, NATO really has stepped up in this cyberspace to deal with this cyber threat because pre-2007, pre the Estonian incident, they simply were not aware that this could happen or not aware of the impact and magnitude. The uh, the centre that you're setting up, undertake joint research looking at hybrid threat impacts upon Australia and Lithuania, assess the society and organisational impact of hybrid threats, explore the impact of hybrid threats upon countries a critical infrastructure, including democratic institutions, develop a joint seminar series exploring these issues and write thought leadership uh, issues regarding the impact. And just coming back to NATO, so I think, one, it's great to have that connection uh, with a country like Lithuania, and I think Australians are learning a lot more about uh, Eastern Europe right now with Ukraine. Uh, do you think the cyber domain is a potential risk? We talk about Russia you know, invading Ukraine and then potentially encroaching further into NATO protected nations. Hmm. Cyber is a domain where, you know, again, they're, they're uh, attacking. I think there's been, I've got uh, some research out of Checkpoint, 196% increase in cyber attacks on Ukraine's government and military uh, over the last few weeks. Uh, and that's, um, and it just, and then again, cyber attacks on Russian organisations increased by 4%. Do you perceive that the cyber domain could be a, a trigger point for a wider escalation? I mean, it's been full on. It's been clearly part of their uh, sort of forced posture moving before the invasion uh, cyber attacks came in. It, 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 it was, but the cyber attacks were limited. So in terms of the cyber attacks that we saw from the Russians, they were denial of service attacks. They were... Uh, hacking into telecommunication systems and sending SMS messages, uh, you know, to, to reservists, not to, you know, uh, go to barracks to, yeah. to join the, the Ukrainian army, which is sort of part of a uh, information warfare campaign. What we didn't see is is what had happened in uh, 2014 in the first uh, Ukrainian-Russian war was when... Uh, the Russians attacked, uh, I'm sorry, or hacked into and disrupted uh, power grid systems in the Ukraine and uh, impacted power for sort of quarter of a million Ukrainians. What we haven't seen is those style of attacks. Partly that's because of uh, greater resilience by yeah. uh, the Ukrainian authorities uh, to, to harden those uh, defences. But also, I wondering. I, I, I actually sort of wondering whether they're going to leave those attacks for other targets, uh, because one of the things about cyber is, from a strategic perspective, the concept of power projection. Cyber attacks allow Russia uh, to project their power to anywhere in the world, which physically they would not be able to do. So um, I can scale it basically. Yeah, and and yeah. and that's what I'm sort of wondering is is what will happen is uh, is we will start to see more detailed and focused cyber attacks on countries that have been more supportive of of the Ukraine, uh, and you will start to see you know uh, attacks on critical infrastructure, uh, more ex expansive ransomware style attacks on, on key systems. So, uh, so uh, yes, so, so, so we have seen, uh, you know, an increase of, of cyber attacks, but a lot of them have been the traditional attacks the Russians have been used in the past in terms yeah. of denial of attacking, service attacks. Yeah, DDoS um, and attacking websites yeah. as well. So controlling yeah. that information flow yeah. or influencing it. Um, but it does have a quite an impact, uh, and that's I think you, you, that was part of your research. There is the society uh, societal impact because you know it's a 
it, it's and sadly it's a good example of how uh, an info war, knowing that it's an info war coming in, and how you can influence or terrorise a population yeah. of 40 million people? Well, 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 I suppose from a research perspective, one of the things that I have seen in, in this situation is actually how the West have been able to shut down some of the Russian outlets, like your access to IT news, uh, access to some of the, the, the news websites like Sputnik, uh, yeah. uh, which have been say, very pro-Putin. One of the things I have noticed is how effective the Ukrainians have been in their information warfare campaigns uh, to the rest of the world, you know, in terms of the daily pictures of Russian equipment that's been uh, destroyed or captured, the Russian prisoners uh, that have been uh, captured and are being interviewed and, you know, said, you know, we thought we were just going on a training course. We, we, we don't want to be here. And and then that's being direct back against the Russians. And, 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 and you're starting to see the early stages of the Russian population, you know, not supporting the war. So I think that the Ukrainians have been extremely successful with their own information warfare capabilities. And I think that's something that the Russians had not considered themselves that they would have had that capability of being so successful with it. it it's a hard one to predict though, isn't it? Uh, because we talk about it, it's built beyond just a cyber attack. And I was going to ask you in terms of, is this information warfare? Uh, it's not cyber uh, security and cyber attack, but they, but they are interdependent and interlinked, mm. uh, are they not? They, they, they are. So, so, so really, uh, the, 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 there's the two aspects. There's the cyber warfare attacks, which is where you use cyber means to attack infrastructure. There's then the information warfare uh, disinformation aspects, which uses some of those cyber attacks. So again, it, it, it's it's putting forward a narrative. It's trying to persuade uh, you know populations to think a certain way to disengage them from from democratic processes, and, and, then, and they the are. Well, sorry to interrupt, but then I was just thinking, I'm thinking aloud, I beg your pardon, but then there's a cyber crime uh, envelope over that where you have third party actors coming in and conducting scams and raising money. And, yeah. You know, it's uh, it's a messy business. Yeah. And, and, and then you've got, yeah, the, uh, the the third party. So so in terms of the Russian context, what they what the, the, the groups that they use is they use the government capabilities like the GRU intelligence organizations. Uh, they use uh, the hacker groups, the ATP groups to act on their behalf. Many of those are involved in uh, ransomware attacks themselves as a as way of generating income. So, you know, they're being able to sort of direct ransomware, you know, not with the idea of, of making money, but the idea of locking down sort of systems. And then you've got this concept of the cyber militia, uh, which is what the Russians used in 2007, is, which was Russian patriotic hackers who hacked on their behalf. As you said, it's those people on the fringe who are either scamming, who, who, are, who are trying to cause disruption. But again, this is something that the Russians have... Uh, have really not understood is that the Ukrainians themselves have now developed a, a cyber militia globally. Uh, and I see Anonymous uh, the, have declared war on Russia as well, right? Yeah. So, so you've got the uh, you've got Anonymous, uh, which is a distributed hacking group uh, undertake activities against Russia. You've then got the uh, Russian government set up what, what they call a, a sort of a cyber army and, and uh, through their telegram channels, distributing information on, on targets that should be attacked, trying to organize, uh, you know, uh, hackers around the world, but, but also particularly in, in the Ukraine to, you know, uh, attack. We, we saw, uh, I think it was outside St. Petersburg, where they had uh, electric charging points for electric cars that had been uh, hacked by a Ukrainian company through a back door, and they had messages on them saying, you know, wow. de derogatory things about Putin, uh, and it was uh, across the entire system. So I, I think this is something that the, the Russians 
always thought that they were at the forefront of this and they're now they're now being a victim of the same sort of attacks uh, which again will have an impact on the Russian population because what's happening is the Russian population are being told one thing by official news. They're seeing the value of the ruble collapse. They're seeing the economic damage. Now they're getting uh, information from other sources, uh, you know, that is contrary to the narrative that they've been given. And, and, and this is, you know, where I think you, you're going to sit, start to see problems within within Russia itself. And it, who do you trust and what information source do you trust? Uh, and it really is that technology divide. I think uh, I just want to bring it in, and I'm conscious of time, but uh, it's a fascinating conversation. And I, I put sadly under everything uh, that we're talking about, but I want to put it in the context uh, of our own region and Australia-China relationship because technically we are... We're not on the doorstep, but uh, certainly in a cyber context, uh, there is a history there of China using uh, cyber as an influencer. Um, how, how much uplift do you think that we need to have here in Australia in that context? Because, you know, not the kinetic war, but the, the cyber warfare yeah. is almost underway. So, 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 so certainly, I, I think the last time we spoke, uh, I talked about the new normal, and and, and yeah. the new normal is all of Australia is at potential risk of cyber attacks from state threat actors, and and that's government, that's organisations, small business, individual citizens, and what as a country we need to do is to have that whole of country response which is what uh, the australian government has done and, and and really that shines through with the 2020 cybersecurity strategy we have the australian cybersecurity center uh, you know uh, leading that awareness of of what uh, you know companies should do in terms of hardening the the the, the, the cyber but but this is, is simply the new normal the, the chinese cyber approach has been different and the Russians, uh, what they're after is really information that gives them a competitive advantage, whether that's IP, whether it's things that can be used in an, in an intelligence perspective. Uh, in terms of their information warfare campaigns, what they're really wanting to do is uh, counter any narrative around their narrative, their worldview. So their worldview is around, you know, the one China, you know, the seat, uh, the seat, Seek up, sorry, silk belt, belt initiatives, yeah. and and what they want to do, you know, is to be able to lock down and counter any narrative uh, that's against that. So, uh, so they're both state fed actors, but they're very different in their sort of capability and how they how they want to use cyber warfare or information warfare. How's how do you perceive the Australian sector? on the difference between cybersecurity and information warfare, information counter uh, warfare. Like, because I, again, maybe it's just my um, sort of perspective on what I hear and see in, in this chair is predominantly cybersecurity and the, the, the GRC, governance, risk and compliance mm -hmm. side uh, and the technical side less so on the intelligence and information warfare side, not hearing too much on it other than um, from professionals like you. How do you, do you see um, the industry there or do you think there's a lot of uplift there to, get to go? I, I, think, I think certainly in cybersecurity, there's been a huge uplift uh, in terms of the information warfare. I, I think that's an area Australia still has to to grow its its capabilities, and and again that that isn't a criticism. It's literally the fact that Australia is not being in the same situation as I would call you know the frontline states of the Baltic yeah. well, or Mike the Burgess, Scandinavia. Yeah, if you think Mike Burgess, head of ASIO, is coming out and saying that there is uh, sort of foreign influence mm. uh, and is sending some signals that that some uplift is required. Uh, so it will be interesting, and uh, I'll give a shout out to the Australian Institute of Professional Intelligence Officers. Uh, mm. I think as well, it comes I think down to uh, the more traditional um, black. Uh, I'm trying to think how what how they used to term it, but uh, the traditional form of intelligence, but in a uh, information yeah. sense, right? Yes, and and again. Uh, 
the government's uh, the government will make those changes in the future uh, again the what we have seen is the the australian government has reacted to the change in security environment whether that's cyber or, or connecticut so I, I i certainly see in the future that that, that we will see a, a greater focus on information warfare as well as uh, cyber warfare uh, and cyber security. Well, Matthew, it's uh, interesting we're in the lead up to an Australian federal election, so I think it will be one to watch. Uh, the politicians have already been sort of put on notice by intelligence professionals and heads of intelligence to say uh, they might have stepped, overstepped the mark in terms of national security. So I think you know, I think everyone needs to be aware uh, of the influence that it can have uh, and also have a trusted point of truth, which is why uh, I always reach out uh, to professional researchers and, and so on like you, Matthew. Um, look, on that note, there's a lot to go on. There's a few uh, uh, stories and articles and releases on our cyberriskleaders.com website in this context. It is a live environment at the moment. We're moving into the second week. Uh, of this invasion and a lot more to come. So, uh, Matthew, it's great to see you partnering with Lithuania uh, and we'll stay tuned with you as well. So thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, Professor uh, Matthew Warren, Director of RMIT University Centre for Cybersecurity Research and Innovation. Enjoy your day.